You are listening to another No Fair Remembering Stuff, the Tuesday edition of the Professional Left Podcast, and available wherever you get your podcasts and at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There is a Patreon button at our website, or you could mail us a letter and or contribution at the Professional Left Podcast, P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. And it's not safe for work. But first, a bit of shameless self-promotion. Uh, next week, I will celebrate the 19th anniversary of a post I wrote, you know, 19 years ago, hence an anniversary. It's entitled Little Red State Fundy. I've mentioned it many times before. I referred to it several times. In honor of that date and that post, there will be cake, there will be toasts given, speeches, medals struck, and probably some sloppy making out in the copy room. But you that's promise? Just, that's just between me and Blue Gal. Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? Now, 19 years later, along comes the Respected Academy to back me up. And uh, I'd like to thank alert listener Thimbles for pointing out that on Greg Sargent's New Republic podcast called The Daily Blast, Harvard professor Daniel Zyblatt has come to almost identical conclusions regarding Trump and fundamentalist Christian operatives. And here is what that professor had to say on that podcast. And yes, we will include a link to the larger podcast, longer podcast in our show notes. Quote, Draw, I'm trying to do a Harvard accent, Blue Gale. And I'm, I'm no, not just at that. read it. Okay. <laughs> we, we, we were going to clip this and put it in the podcast. We had some questions about fair use on that. Yeah. Uh, but we will link to it in our show notes. And this is a transcript of what the professor said. So this is now, quote, Drawing really on these historical examples, it's a work of history, but I think there's some general lessons out of this, which is that conservative elites often don't know how to mobilize bases. They don't know how to access voters, conservative traditional elites. And so what they do is they rely on outside groups to do this, whether this is in the 19th century, veterans groups or various religious groups. In the 21st century, this is often Christian evangelicals various other kinds of organizations, media organizations, and you kind of outsource the mobilization to these kinds of organizations. It's opening the Pandora's box, though, because what ends up happening is conservative elites at some point lose control of these groups and become captured by these groups. And I think that's what's happened to the Republican Party over the last 30 years. That's not drift class talking. That's a Harvard professor talking with a lot of research at his command. Meanwhile, back to the quote. I mean, there's a kind of classic bargain that was struck beginning in the 1970s, the 1980s, where establishment Republicans realized that in order to win elections, they needed to mobilize the Christian right. And so you had guys like George Bush Sr., who were culturally very distant from that, relying on that base. And when they relied on that base, at first, it was a pretty good deal. They could get access to all these voters. They could carry out their economic agenda. And they would often fail to deliver on the kinds of promises like, say, uh, restricting abortion rights and so on. So for a generation, they failed to deliver on these promises. And eventually, I think when you look at Trump, it's sort of a revenge of these promises, unkept promises to the Republican base over a generation. And the party then, against the wishes of the economic elite, Back to 2016, what happened was you had a primary process where the economic elites of the Republican Party were very much against Donald Trump. They're on the side of Jeb Bush, for example, or Marco Rubio. The establishment lost. There was a kind of revenge of the base that had been fed these stories. And Donald Trump represents the triumph of that base that had been fed these stories for a generation, unquote. Once again, hmm. this sounds very much like something Drift Glass wrote 19 years ago. Doesn't it sound really familiar? I was thinking about, you know, 10, 15 years before that. I mean, you and I thought and were active in politics long before podcasting and yeah. blogging. So yeah. this was not news to us, but the fact that there's now a Harvard professor with a lot of data saying, yep, Drift Glass was right all along. <laughs> as I will take that all day long. So, you know, why bring it up? Because we've reached the point where there is now a profound and really dangerous mismatch between 
the country as it exists and the country as the mainstream media wishes it to be. That's right. Mm -hmm. For decades, the mainstream press ignored the actual Republican voters who lived far away from the centers of media power. From time to time, the media would notice the popularity of hate radio stars like Rush Limbaugh or the aggressively theocratic views of conservative evangelicals like Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson, but they were never really taken seriously in nope. terms of their impact on politics. Mm -hmm. Instead, the media created, to borrow a phrase from William Gibson, a consensual hallucination. Elite conservatives and elite media both made up an almost entirely fictional Republican base in an idealized Norman Rockwell version of their own image, an imaginary base that read their kids' bedtime stories out of the golden book of Edmund Burke stories for children <laughs> and cared deeply. You know, this base cares deeply, Driftglass, deep, about so tax deep. cuts for rich so people. <laughs> so deeply, so They care much. so much about deficits. And really, big government is their enemy. Right. Mm-hmm. And the media elites maintain that fairy tale, even as anyone with eyes could see clearly that this was not what was motivating Republican voters to go to the polls. Mm -hmm. Republican base voters were motivated by the hate and fear and paranoia and rage that Fox News and hate radio Glenn Beck and Rush Limbaugh and all of their ilk fed them every single day. Uh-huh. But like a church with an aging and shrinking congregation, elite conservatives and elite media went right on clinging to their rituals and traditions built around the imaginary Republican base and their both sides do it fetish long after those rituals and traditions became ridiculous. And then came along Donald Trump to tear their temple down. Yeah. And he, he had absorbed the same hate radio the same Fox News that the base did. Yeah. And repeated it to them. In their language. Spoke to them in their language. And they knew, oh, yeah. this guy speaks our language. Yeah. <clears throat> the thing is, long before this, in 1994, the New York Times ran an article about how Rush Limbaugh delivered the Republican majority uh, in the House in 1994. And how the Republican Party thought, uh, credited him with that told him that he had won the party for them or won the election for them, gave him the title majority maker, had a parade for him. It was like, and, and it took all these years, a, a generation for them to figure out that that wasn't just a fluke. That was actually the party. So the question we're going to ask ourselves today is about one of those anachronistic rituals. And that question is not whether there should be presidential debates or, you know, how many presidential debates should there be, but instead, why in the hell would any sane person want there to be presidential debates at all? That's why this week's episode of No Fair Remembering Stuff, your favorite podcast, is No Fair Remembering Trump-era presidential debates. And I may subtitle it, There Is No More Debating Trump. Yeah. No, that's actually a better title. Yeah. So <laughs> Maybe I'll just Ignore what I just one. said. That's actually a better title. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you see, we're, we're doing this on the fly, folks. Mm-hmm. Uh, but first, we need to go back to the good old days. Mm -hmm. That bygone time when America was young and beautiful and the world stood on the razor's edge of nuclear annihilation. You know, the good the old days. The year is 1960. The day is October 21st, and Drift Class, neither one of us are born yet. Nope. Nope. The place is ABC Television Studio in New York City. Now, this was the fourth of four presidential debates, televised debates. Mm -hmm between Republican Vice President Richard Nixon and Democratic Senator John F. Kennedy. And I really do recommend people go back to YouTube and listen to as much of these debates as you can. Yeah. It is a bygone era. Oh, God. <laughs> when dinosaurs walked the earth blue. Yeah. yeah. And people took the, the voters seriously in the media, mm -hmm. thought, okay, you're an educated populace and we're not going to try to distract you from what are actual issues going on. Yeah. I mean, Nixon would do a checkers speech to save yeah. his career. Right. And it worked. Right. But by and large, they were, and you can disagree with the politics. You can say the, the communist menace was crazy and overrated. You can, there's a lot of stuff to find that you can disagree with the roots of the Vietnam war, yeah, a whole bunch right. of things, but you can't ignore the fact that these were actually serious people 
having a serious debate about serious issues or serious issues to them at the time. Right, right. Now, in this debate, Quincy Howe was the moderator and Frank Singazer, John Edwards, Walter Cronkite and John Chancellor were the panelists. Questions were related to foreign affairs. And the subject in this question were two tiny islands in the Taiwan Strait called Kamoi and Matsu. Take it away, John Chancellor. John Chancellor's question for Vice President Nixon. <clears throat> Sir, I'd like to ask you an, another question about Kamoi and Matsu. Both you and Senator Kennedy say you agree with the president on this subject and with our treaty obligations. But the subject remains in the campaign as an issue. Now, is, sir, is this because each of you feels obliged to respond to the other when he talks about Kamoy and Matsu? And if that's true, do you think an end should be called to this discussion, or will it stay with us as a campaign issue? It was such an in-depth and nerdy question. And Nixon and Kennedy's answers to this one go on for like 15 minutes. And that is what it's supposed to sound like when two well-informed adults actually debate an issue that at that moment seemed very important. There was no audience booing or cheering because there was no audience. There were no freak show stunts. These were just grown-ups arguing with each other respectfully. Now, let's consider what a presidential debate sounds like these days. Well, that's because he'd rather have a puppet as president of no the United puppet, States. No puppet. And it's pretty clear. You're the puppet. It's pretty clear you won't admit no, you're that the, the Russians. That is from 2016. So the same two political parties, 56 years apart. What happened? Well, I'll tell you. Newt Gingrich happened, and Lee Atwater happened, and Reagan killing the Fairness Doctrine happened. And Rupert Murdoch and Rush Limbaugh and Jerry Falwell and Pat Robertson happened and Citizens United and Ken Starr and the whole Fox News lineup and on and on and on. And at last, the little red state fundy phenomena that I wrote about nearly 20 years ago came to pass in the person of Donald Trump. But long before Trump showed up, the real Republican base had lost interest in the priorities of the Republican elite. For an entire generation, Republican elites had been promising the base all sorts of goodies, from the end of abortion for the fundies to a quick and easy victory in Iraq for the blowing up brown people crowd. And for the bigots and imbeciles, a permanent Republican majority that would make Democrats cry bitter tears forever. Yes, us dirty, America-hating, terrorist-loving Democrats. Mm hmm and while Republican elites got everything they wanted, tax cuts for billionaires under Reagan, under Bush, even under Trump. Cut those regulations. Yeah, cut regulations, put conservatives on the court to stop regulations. All that happened for them election after election. The base got nothing but excuses and more promises of even greater rewards down the road. Mm -hmm. And then came Trump. Yeah, they'd run out of patience. They were yeah. they were waiting for the person they'd been promised to deliver the promises they'd been made. And along came Trump. Now, there were a total of three presidential debates in 2016. The first was on September 26th, and it set the record as the most watched presidential debate in American history with 84 million viewers. Remember that number, because that number translates into money. The second debate took place on August 9th, and the third took place on, uh, I'm sorry, on, uh, on October 9th, and the third took place on October 19th, and they were terrible. In the first debate, Trump got absolutely crushed. This is from NBC News about the first Clinton-Trump debate. Quote, Hillary Clinton seemed to overpower Donald Trump in their first presidential debate Monday night as the Republican nominee stumbled over his words and found himself spending most of the night on his heels, unquote. And here's what Chuck Todd had to say about it when it was all over. This is the most abnormal event I have ever witnessed. This was not a normal political debate. Let's not sit here and pretend we saw something that is a quadrennial uh, occasion here. This was as surreal as some thought it might be. It was clear both candidates didn't lie to us about how they prepared for this debate. Hillary Clinton was at times even, you could argue, overprepared. And her opening statement must have had 15 policy proposals within that two minutes. So Hillary was overprepared. Well, fuck you, Chuck Todd. But you know what? It didn't matter. All it did was reset the bar for Trump in the second debate so low that all he had to do was literally show up and not shit his pants. Yep. And then came the second debate. 
And if this is too triggering for some of you who've given up on listening to Trump altogether, I totally get it. Uh, I understand if you just want to jump ahead to the end. But we both felt that at the rate the immediate past is being memory hold, that in our own small way, we had to stand athwart that tide of forgettery and shout, stop. <laughs> After all, the podcast is called No Fair Remembering Stuff. Right. So. And we have to remember. I mean, that moment when Chuck Todd said Hillary is overprepared. Yeah. That was the moment when, OK, it's time to shut these down. Yeah. This is not an actual exercise in persuading anyone. No, no. And uh, so CBS reprinted some of the second debate with Trump and Hillary Clinton. They did post-debate reactions from CNN commentators and guest analysts. This is from Errol Lewis, quote, Donald Trump, with his campaign on the ropes, came out swinging. He made a few solid points, especially on reforming the tax code, but otherwise seemed irritated and irritable. In a continuation of the meltdown that began after a leaked video on Friday showed him making lewd comments about women. That's the Hollywood Access tape. Mm -hmm. Trump struggled with the town hall style format, frequently looming over Clinton as she answered questions, interrupting her frequently and bickering with moderators Martha Raddatz and Anderson Cooper over whether he got enough time to respond to questions. At other points, his assertions were downright shocking, such as his blunt threat to, as president, have a special investigator look into Hillary Clinton's emails and potentially jail her. He also admitted not having paid federal income tax for decades, implying that other wealthy Americans do the same, and blaming Clinton for not reforming the tax code during her years in the Senate. Another startling moment was Trump's admission that he and his running mate, Mike Pence, haven't discussed key Syria policies and actually disagree on the key issue of whether to launch military strikes at the forces of Syrian dictator Bashar al-Assad, a direct contradiction of what Pence, his vice presidential candidate, said at the recent vice presidential candidates debate, unquote. So he lied. So they weren't talking to one another or coordinating, apparently. No, no just making shit up, because who's going to check, really? Who cares? But here's the important point. Trump did what he had to do. He did well enough to keep his campaign alive and give hope to his supporters, which is all he was talking to. The only people he was talking to are the lunatics who were going to go out and vote for him and believe that he was the answer to their prayers. But his performance did little to rebut Clinton's main argument, her own argument, that Trump was manifestly unqualified to serve as president. This is Sally Cohn in the same article talking about how unprepared the media was to handle what was happening right in front of them. Quote, What's especially depressing is that our media, let alone our democracy, seems ill-equipped to handle anything like Trump. Martha Raddatz and Anderson Cooper tried, but fact-checking Trump doesn't work because Trump doesn't care about facts. In fact, he denies he's lying as he's lying, and then for extra audacity, accuses everyone else of being liars. I keep waiting for the ghost of George Orwell to show up on the debate stage and bite Trump on the ankles. Donald Trump is a perverse man who is perverting not only our democracy, but the very concept of truth. He tried to win the debate just like one wins a limbo contest by lowering the bar. That should depress all of us, unquote. Politico rounded up some of its own people to recap what they saw during the same debate. Quote, we asked some of the savviest political watchers and operatives to talk us through what we just witnessed. Incomprehensibly demoralizing, a grim, tawdry affair, and surreal, bizarre, and often entertaining Ooh. were some of their responses, unquote. Yeah. Now, getting back to more serious coverage, this is from Nicole Hemmer, assistant professor at the University of Virginia's Miller Center, co-host of the Past Present podcast, and author of Messengers of the Right, Conservative Media, and the Transformation of American Politics. Quote, so far outside the norm that it is hard to position it fully within the history of presidential debates. Sunday night was the lowest point in presidential debate history, no contest. A major party candidate vowed that if his opponent won, 
he would have her prosecuted and imprisoned. Lock her up has been a disturbing rally chant for months now. But Donald Trump has never gone so far as to promise Hillary Clinton's prosecution. We've never seen such a wholesale attack, not just on a candidate, but on the rule of law. But if a co- if constitutional order isn't your thing, there were plenty of other low points. Trump, faced with his boasts about sexually assaulting women, offered not an apology, but a dismissal. Locker room talk. He trotted out women who have accused Bill Clinton of sexual misconduct, seating them in the front row of the audience and shouting them out early in the debate. He accused Hillary Clinton of having tremendous hate in her heart. None of this is normal. Indeed, it's so far outside the norm that it is hard to position it fully within the history of presidential debates. There just aren't any parallels. You'll notice I haven't mentioned Clinton's responses. That's because she delivered a standard debate performance, one modeled after her husband's empathetic turn at the first town hall debate in 1992. She spoke personally and with warmth to audience members and repeatedly pivoted toward her central campaign themes. Trump baited. She refused to bite. Unquote. And just as an aside, what the media couldn't get through their heads was that Trump voters, Republican voters, love this shit. Yep. They love seeing him behave like a tyrant. They love seeing him strut around on the stage and threatening a woman. Just because misogyny. Over and Absolutely. They love the misogyny. They love the racism. They love all this. They their their image, their their fairy tale of the Republican base could not be reconciled with why Trump was doing this. And we were over here on the left screaming because he's appealing to the actual Republican base, you idiots, not the people you've made up in your imagination. They couldn't see it. They wouldn't see it. Now, this is from Michael Kazin, professor of history at Georgetown University and editor of Dissent Magazine. Quote, the lowest point in this debate and any debate since the first ones in 1960 was when Donald Trump vowed to prosecute Hillary Clinton if he wins the presidency and then said she should be in jail already. Declaring yourself judge and the jury is what tyrants do, not presidents who have to abide by the Constitution and the common law. But otherwise, the debate was rather predictable. Trump was Trump, bombastic, aggressive, arrogant, eminently quotable. Clinton was Clinton, rather wonkish and defensive, but effective when she emphasized how central tolerance of differences is to a working democracy, unquote. But to me, drift class, the most surreal comment of all came from Newt Gingrich the father of modern Republican bomb-throwing and slander, who was wringing his hands over, quote, the culture has changed, unquote. You know the shame, blue gal? <laughs> New Gingrich whining that, oh my God, the culture has changed. This is Gingrich, quote, we now live in a much tougher, more, uh, uh, we now live in a much tougher, more open and more vulgar world. It's part of Daniel Patrick Moynihan's essay on defining deviancy downward, unquote. This is Newt Gingrich complaining about how vulgar and deviant people are in politics these days. Oh, my God. These kids today with their Trumps and everything. Remember, yeah. this is before- <laughs> he didn't mention Trump by no. name. It's just generally speaking, we've the gotten culture. more vulgar. It's, and and what he means is both sides, everybody, the yeah. whole thing. Not me. Don't blame Newt Gingrich. Newt Gingrich wasn't even there. I didn't run over your dog. Your dog's corpse is on a wheel. But that wasn't me. It had nothing to do with me. Remember, this is before Trump won. So it was before Gingrich became just another Trump stooge. And Gingrich's six-year mistress slash wife was made ambassador to the Vatican. This is why Gingrich was hedging his language and tisk-tisking the culture. Mm -hmm. From Virginia Hefferman, author of Magic and Loss, The Internet as Art. Quote, although Trump has just been roundly censured by Republicans, including his own wife and running mate, for boasting about violently seizing women's vaginas, and although Trump had convened a surprise press conference with three women who have accused Bill Clinton of sexual assault, the evening didn't seem like a freak show or a media circus or evidence of the coarsening of American politics. It just seemed profoundly sad. Even Michelle Obama's winner, when Clinton reprised it, when they go low, we go high, seem to have lost its freshness. 
Trump's relentless pride in his shallowness, greed, abuses of power, bigotry, incompetence in business, incitements to violence, and even sedition, none of this seemed merely low anymore, like an oh-no-he-didn't episode of The Apprentice. It seemed instead incomprehensibly demoralizing, desperately sad, unquote. And of course, that's before he won. (laughs) Right. And that, again... All of the things that she saw as monstrous, the the bigotry, incompetence, incitement to violence, sedition, his fans love it. Mm -hmm. The base loves that stuff. That to them is pure gold. This is from Anita Dunn, Democratic political strategist and former White House communications director under Barack Obama. Quote, the issue will be whether Donald Trump has so rewritten the standards that his absence of a catastrophic meltdown this evening becomes a victory. Mm -hmm. Unquote. Yeah. Well, that was the second debate. And here, in short, was the third debate. Well, that's because he'd rather have a puppet as president of no the United puppet, States. No puppet. And it's pretty clear. You're the puppet. It's pretty clear you won't admit no, you're that the, the Russians. And you know what? None of it mattered. By any objective standard of debate judging, Clinton wiped the floor with Trump three times in a row. But it didn't matter because these are no longer debates in any sense. Pretending it was a debate did Hillary no favors. This was just a stage for Trump to preen and bellow and lie and show his followers that he was one of them. Mm -hmm. And putting the two of them on stage together automatically equalized them in a significant way. It told Clinton voters that, holy shit, this guy is really dangerous. And it told Trump voters, holy shit, we could really win this thing. Mm -hmm. They're both sides, equally presidential candidates. There they are up on the stage, both in podiums, both talking, both in suits. In 2020, there were two debates between Trump and Joe Biden. The first took place on September 29th of 2020. The second was canceled due to Trump's COVID-19 diagnosis and refusal to appear remotely rather than in person. The final debate took place on October 22nd. Mm-hmm. And they were worse than 2016. The, the 22nd one was the one where he nearly killed Chris Christie by, you know, breathing Doing COVID on him. prep while yeah. he had COVID. Yes. Uh, this is from NPR, September 30th, 2020. Quote, this was maybe the worst presidential debate in American history. If this was supposed to be a boxing match and it instead turned into President Trump jumping on the ropes, refusing to come down, the referee trying to coax him off and Joe Biden standing in the middle of the ring with his gloves on and a confused look on his face. Trump doesn't play by anyone's rules, even those he's agreed to beforehand. He's prided himself on that. But even by his standards, what Trump did Tuesday night crossed many lines. More than 200,000 Americans are dead from the coronavirus pandemic. And instead of a serious debate about the direction of the country, Trump sent it off the rails, unquote. You all might remember, This was the debate when Trump attacked Hunter Biden and decided to bring up his past cocaine use as an issue, and that backfired. This was the debate where Trump refused to denounce white supremacists and militia groups. Instead, he said, quote, Proud Boys, stand back and stand by, unquote. And here's a fun fact. The Proud Boys are now using Trump's own words as part of their new logo. This was the debate where Trump refused to tell his followers to remain calm as votes are counted even if there were delays in reporting the results. Instead, this is what he said, quote, I'm urging my supporters to go into the polls and watch very carefully because that's what has to happen. If it's a fair election, I'm 100% on board. If I see tens of thousands of ballots being manipulated, I can't go along with that, unquote. And at some point, the moderator, Chris Wallace, who then worked for Fox News, more or less gave up trying to even control Trump in any way. Trump lied about COVID. He lied about Biden's record. He lied about his approval ratings. He lied about everything because he had a live mic at a live event. So there was no reason not to. And there was no live fact checking. No. This was a Time Magazine headline for that week. The first 2020 presidential debate was nasty, brutish, and long. Quote, it did not take long for the first presidential debate of the 2020 general election to spiral totally out of control. President Donald Trump simply would not stop talking, badgering, heckling, taunting, and sniping at both his opponent and the moderator. 
Finally, Joe Biden could only blurt, Will you shut who is up, your, man? Listen. Trump, of course, did nothing of the sort, unquote. CBS News brought its Both Sides Do It game to post-debate reporting with headlines like this, quote, First debate descends into chaos as Trump and Biden exchange attacks, unquote. Their other debate was more civil but did nothing to move any votes. Polling for each candidate both before and after the debate remained virtually unchanged. So what the hell was the point? Mm -hmm. Well, we think the point was that like the aging church with the shrinking congregation, every elite media incentive drove them to go right on clinging to this archaic ritual despite the fact that it in no way longer, any longer served its original purpose in any meaningful way. It's gone. It's obsolete. It's dead. But they keep dragging the corpse around as if it were still alive. Now, remember, back in 2016, the now former executive chairman of CBS, Les Moonves, made it very, very clear where the media's interests were. He called the 2016 presidential election a circus and said that there was a lot of bomb throwing, and he hoped it would continue because, quote, it may not be good for America, but it's damn good for CBS, unquote. Big audiences are profitable, even when what that audience is watching is democracy throwing itself in front of a train. Continuing to have debates despite the fact that one of the two candidates is a lying, unhinged sociopath who's proven over and over again that he would break his promises to behave himself whenever he felt like it and also helps the elite media continue to pretend that on some level, things are still kind of normal, that their addiction to toxic both siderism still has some journalistic merit. Which it absolutely doesn't. No. And that brings us at last to this headline, and this is a headline from this week in Voice of America News, quote, news organization urge Biden, Trump, to commit to presidential debates. Twelve news organizations on Sunday urged presumptive presidential nominees Joe Biden and Donald Trump, to agree to debate. So please, <laughs> please debate, please. Saying they were a rich tradition that has been part of every general election campaign since 1976. While Trump, who did not participate in debates for the Republican nomination, has indicated a willingness to take on his 2020 rival. That's a lie. Mm -hmm. The Democratic president has not committed to debating him again. Again, that's not what this is about. But continuing with the article, if there is one thing Americans can agree on during this polarized time, oh. it is that the stakes of this election are exceptionally high, the news organization said in a joint statement. Amidst that backdrop, there is simply no substitute for the candidates debating with each other and before the American people, their visions for the future of our nation. Because their visions are so unclear at this point. No one really knows what, <laughs> what Trump will do. What their visions are. Yeah, yes. Yeah, it's, it's all up in the air. ABC, CBS, CNN, Fox, PBS, NBC, NPR, and the Associated Press all signed on to the letter. C-SPAN, News Nation, and Univision also joined the letter calling for debates. Only one newspaper, USA Today, added its voice. The Washington Post declined a request to join. Certainly, the broadcasters could use the juice that debates may bring. Television news ratings are down significantly compared with the 2020 campaign, although there are other factors involved, such as cord cutting and the pandemic, that increased interest in news four years ago. There were no Democratic debates this presidential cycle, and Trump's refusal to participate in the Republican forums depressed interest in them, unquote. I'm probably the only person that watched the uh, Republican debates, and that was because of an obligation I felt to appear on the broadcast and talk about that train wreck with uh, Digby and Brad and the rest of them. But yeah, the audiences were way, way down. So it's no surprise that if you tap the presidential debate news alert, you'll find headline after headline after headline begging Biden to agree to a debate, which is ludicrous. The rare exception to this can be found in the Boston Globe yesterday, quote, have presidential debates outlive their usefulness? There are better ways for the public to hear from presidential candidates. I say good riddance to the televised presidential debate, unquote. And while I can't believe I'm doing it, I will now quote David Frum in The Atlantic today. Quote, why Biden should not debate Trump. 
the networks want their show. But to give the challenger equal status on a TV stage would be a dire normalization of his attempted coup, unquote. He's absolutely right. 100% right. I, I, I completely agree with him. And it's so obviously true that mm-hmm. you're never going to hear about it anyplace other than apparently the Atlantic and the Professional Life podcast. If Biden declines to debate, you know, as sure as May follows April, all the usual whiners and Beltway sages will pitch all the usual tantrums. And I say, screw them. Screw them all. Or to put it another way. Let them eat static. So have we been completely clear that we do not think presidential debates serve any purpose whatsoever and that Joe Biden should categorically refuse to debate Donald Trump? I think we've been pretty clear about that, Blue Gal. What do you think? <laughs> well, I the other thing is to remember how much in the Obama years the Republican base had to swallow. Yeah. With John McCain uh, losing to Obama, which mm-hmm. was the end of the world. For right. the Republican base, even though he had a black that, man in the White House, even though he had that nice lady on his he ticket, he had Sarah loved. Palin, who is you know the precursor to Trump, is Absolutely. Palin, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but Romney, I mean, you can absolutely blame the the RNC and the mainstream media for nominating Mitt Romney, mm-hmm. a Massachusetts billionaire with a car elevator who was pro-choice. Yeah, until five minutes ago. Until five minutes ago. Who was the um, unnamed father of Obamacare? Yeah. You know? And and he had to hide all that and pretend it wasn't real. And pretend, and pretend it wasn't he real. wasn't and pretend that he, he cared about people. And this was, you know, we weren't we really weren't over completely the 2008 uh, economic disaster. No. A lot of people, had, including you, hadn't gotten their jobs back. And never did, like and me. And never did. Yeah. And here's this billionaire saying, well, you know, the poor people are pretty much taken care of. Yeah. And uh, we want to take care of those who need it. But and and just absolutely tone deaf. Yeah. Well, the car industry can just. Yeah. The worry, car the industry private, can go to hell. Private yeah. sector can take care of that. Private private equity will take care of the car. No, uh, and, and the, and the ads showing showing, you know, the the guys having to build the stage in order for an announcement to be made. Some hedge fund people are coming in to destroy their jobs for them. I mean, it was just horrible. And so there really was an uprising within yeah. the within the Republican base to say enough. And as you have said many times, the Republican base manifested Trump. He did. Absolutely. Because they were they had had it. They had had it with the RNC deciding what was good for them and lying to them over and over again that, oh, yeah, we care about these social issues and we care about you as economic individuals. We want to help you. Yeah. And no, they wanted tax cuts for billionaires and deregulation. That's what they wanted. And the base had been... What did Trump give them? Tax cuts for billionaires and deregulation. But but he gave them other stuff too. He gave gave them a a coarse, Mm -hmm. nasty, bullying... Of Democrats, and they and they still and they and they, loved him for it. Yeah. And more people came out to vote for him in 2020 than voted for him in 2016. Yeah. yeah, and and there was you know, and he he was, to use a Dune reference, the Lisan Al Ghib, the voice for the outer world. Yeah. They the the Republican base had been shaped, their brains had been shaped by constant exposure to Republican media, to conservative media, to to expect a Messiah who looked and sounded a certain way and made certain promises and spoke to them in blunt angry, racist tones, which mm-hmm. is what they have learned is the proper language to use in politics. And along comes Trump, who's a billionaire, who's got a model wife, and who who says, fuck you to the establishment, who said the Iraq war was a mistake, mm-hmm. and George Bush screwed you, which is like, thank you, because yeah. they wanted to be let off the hook for that so badly. Yep. They wanted to be absolved of that sin so badly. And here of it having comes, voted so, for Bush twice. Yes. It wasn't your fault. Which George Bush was, it was Bush's fault. It was the elite's yeah. fault, not your fault. It's never the, the voters' fault. And they loved him for it. And mm-hmm. one other thing before we wrap it up, which is you and I have said this before, and we both mean it very sincerely. We miss having sane debates with people who we disagree with. Yep. Desperately. We both had them. We, You guys probably never had that if you were of a certain age, but we actually had debates with conservative people we knew mm-hmm. or Republican people we knew that were not hammer throwing fuck you your no. mother's a whore and it's intoxicating Heck. to do that it's it fun is. it is 
when you can actually debate someone who has facts at their disposal and a yeah. different position mm -hmm. and and wants to learn from you and right. wants to teach you something, it's fun. And and who can agree that here is a social problem to be solved. Mm -hmm. Public mm -hmm. transportation or education, whatever it might be. Right. We can agree that people starving is bad. Yep. We can agree that poverty is bad. We can agree that a lack of medical care on a, on a rational basis is bad for society, for whatever reason you want, because a smart society doesn't, or a merciful or a Christian society doesn't do these things. It doesn't matter. We all agree these are problems, and we can debate how to solve them. That doesn't exist anymore yep. anywhere on the right no. at all, which is why debating them is insane, because it's all grunts and oinks and squeals and screams. Right. Right. They don't speak a human language anymore when it comes to policy or problem solving. So putting yourself on stage with them just makes you equal to them, which yeah. is nuts. It, it makes seven bills on appliances yeah. an actual issue, which yeah. it isn't. No, none of that's an issue. So so let's not do that. Oh, one and, more thing. And I really think that, that Biden needs to come up with a one-liner, and maybe he does need to just steal it from David Frum. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to normalize the coup. Yeah. By, by standing on a stage with the guy who called violent thugs to, to try to undo an election. I'm not going to do it. I prefer fuck that guy, but that's just me. <laughs> and that's probably Don't just forget, on that note, we really need more Patreons to make this podcast fly. If you can spare five bucks, please spare five bucks. We're worth it. And visit our Patreon at patreon.com slash proleftpod. And thank you for that. And see you next time. See you next time. The Professional Left Podcast, No Fair Remembering Stuff, Tuesday edition, is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2024-25, DGBG Productions. <laughs>